This is going to be a review of the Part A of the January 2023 Regents exam. I will explain all the answers. You might want to grab a sheet of paper and a pen or a pencil. I'd grab my reference tables, maybe a calculator. You're working hard. You're practicing. The key to passing this exam, in my opinion, you have to do work on your own. There are 50 multiple choice and then 30 short answer, 35, excuse me, short answer questions. You have to get a 50 out of 85 to just pass the regents usually. It's a difficult task. You want to maximize how well you do on the multiple choice. So of the total 50 multiple choice, if you're not getting about 40 out of the 50 right in total going into the short answer, you might be in trouble. Again, I can't emphasize enough practicing on your own. I'm glad you're here. Let's get to it. Question one right off the bat is an old question they used to ask a whole bunch of times, then got away, away from, and sure enough, here it is again, and the conclusion from the gold foil experiment. There are two conclusions. The one here in number one, atoms mostly empty space, that's one, and then there's a positive dense center. Those were the two conclusions. You have to know them. You see it right here in question one. For question two, which two particles each have a mass of approximately 1 AMU. 1 AMU goes for a proton and for a neutron. If you go through the list, here they are, neutron and a proton. Now, real quick, don't forget about reference table O. I forgot about reference table O. Why do I say that? Well, all of the particles here, the top number here in the upper left-hand corner, remember, is the mass. Notice the proton has a 1 and our neutron has a one. Those are the only two particles here that have one AMU. The only other particle here that has mass is an alpha particle. Alpha particle is part of alpha decay with nuclear count. But your neutron and proton, it's right here. If you're gonna get yourself confused, take a look at this table. Okay, in question three, excited potassium atom emits, that means releases, a specific amount of energy when one of its electrons moves from that's going to be up from a higher level down to a lower lower level. It emits energy. So we're looking from higher to low. First to fourth in question one can't be the answer. Second to fourth can't be the answer. Fourth to fifth, nope. The only one is fourth to second shell. So the answer is four. For question four, which list of elements include a metal, a metalloid, which is a semi-metal, and a noble gas? We're looking for those three. Let's check out the periodic table. Make sure you know where things are. All right. Well, two thirds of your periodic table, of course, are metals. Then we have our semi-metals or metalloids. Here at the staircase, there are six. So for these four on the staircase and these two below, know them. And then your noble gases are group 18. Other groups that are important, 17. I'll wait for it. Good. It's the halogens. Of course, you have your transition metals here in the middle of the table. We have our alkali and our alkaline earth. We need to spot the metal, the semi-metal or metalloid, and the noble gas. Let's go back. If we take a look at the choices, we can eliminate choice one because chlorine is a halogen, and choice three because chlorine is a halogen. Now we have to find a metal, a metalloid, and a noble gas. That's actually going to be here in choice two. Can't be choice four because we have a metalloid and we have two metals. That's what makes it choice two. For question five, which element has the lowest density at 298K and 101KPA? The argon, fluorine, nitrogen, and oxygen. Right away, this isn't something you had to memorize. You don't have to calculate anything. You just need to go to good old reference table S. Here at reference table S, I circled the densities and I knocked out the first couple of zeros so we can compare and figure out which is the lowest number. And of them, it is going to be nitrogen at 0.001145. And that's going to be our answer. Question five choice three. Okay, for question six, which phase describes a crystal structure and properties of two different forms of solid carbon called diamond and graphite? I'm sure you've heard the word allotrope before. This is classic New York State Regents question 
where they don't use the vocabulary word allotrope, but you have to know that it means different crystal structure and different properties, even though it's made up of the same atoms of the same element. So two different forms of carbon. Again, different crystal structure, different properties, choice three. For seven, which element has chemical properties most similar to sodium? This is a classic example of the New York State Regents, whoever writes these uh, questions, to see if students are lazy and won't look up the symbols. If you don't know the symbols for all the elements, go to reference table S again. Sodium is Na. What we're looking for is an element in the same group or column, right? That's an alkali metal. So we're looking at Mg. We're looking for O. We're looking for P. And we're looking for Rb. All right, here we are at the periodic table, and you can pretty much see right away the only choice that's in the same column is rubidium Rb. Four for question seven. For question eight, which substance contains elements chemically combined in a fixed proportion? That is the definition for a compound. Three of these four choices are elements. And if you don't know which is which, one of the ways you can work around it, yes, is reference table S again. Manganese is an element. Methane, that's your answer. It's a compound. Now, you might know that from bonding way back when, CH4 has polar bonds, nonpolar molecule, so weak attractions. You know it from organic chem. Silicon, element, strontium, element. All right, for question nine, which property can be used to differentiate between a 50 gram sample of solid potassium nitrate at STP, that's standard temperature and pressure, and a 50 gram sample of solid silver chloride at standard temperature and pressure? Well, they're both 50 grams, and we know that's a unit for mass. They're both at STP, so their temperatures are the same. We're both solids, so the phase is the same. The only thing it could be is solubility. What that means to us is one's soluble in water and one is insoluble. Let me show you quick on the reference table where you would look. This is the solubility guidelines for aqueous solutions, table F. Now, potassium nitrate, whether it's potassium, group one, or the nitrate, which is NO3 minus, those are both reasons that potassium nitrate is soluble. For silver chloride, most of the time chloride compounds are soluble, but notice silver is an exception. So if it's an exception, it's insoluble. So their solubilities in water are definitely different. All right, question 10, which type of bonds form when electrons are equally shared between two atoms? If they're equally shared, sharing is caring, that's covalent. And if it's equal, it's going to be a non-polar covalent bond, which is choice two. Hey, 10 down, 20 to go. Question 11. Which statement describes the changes in bonding and energy that occur when a molecule of iodine, I2, forms two separate atoms of iodine? In other words, I2 is a nonpolar covalent bond two iodine atoms, and if you're going to separate them, you are going to break the bond. That's the first thing. And in order to break bonds, energy is absorbed. So that makes the answer for number 11, 3. If you find it difficult to remember, you can remember the letters B-A-R-F, barf. In order to break a bond, energy needs to be absorbed. If you're going to form a bond, energy is going to be released. On to number 12, the degree of polarity in the bond between a hydrogen and an oxygen atom in a molecule of water can be assessed using the difference in. This is the vocabulary word that shows up all the time, even if the word doesn't. Just like allotrope, the definition of an allotrope shows up all the time on the Regents' exams, at least two out of three per year. They don't use the word allotrope, but when you have nonmetals, or nonmetal atoms of the same element in different structures, you get different properties. Here, what they're talking about with degree of polarity is choice two or electronegativity. For 13, which substances cannot be broken down by a chemical change? We're talking here an element. You got to go through the four choices ammonia, that is, of course, a molecule, ethanol is a molecule, krypton, there you go, there's our element. 
Water, of course, is a molecule compound. If you don't know which one is the element, check out reference table S. So question 14, which sample of matter is a mixture? If you have a mixture, right, it's two or more substances that are just physically combined with one another. It's not going to just be one phase. So it's not going to be CO2. It's not going to be CCL4 as a liquid or tin as a solid. It has to be the solution. AQ, remember, means water and magnesium chloride as a salt. So salty water, in this case, magnesium chloride solution. For 15, which term is used to explain which term is used to express the concentration of an aqueous solution? Well, the only one it can be is parts per million. That's one way. Another way would be molarity or percent. Heat diffusion, that's with calorimetry. Pressure, no. Volume, no. For 16, the particles in which sample have the lowest average kinetic energy. Forget about the masses. Forget about the atoms that make up those samples. We're talking here temperature. Remember, temperature is a measure of the average kinetic energy. If we want the lowest kinetic energy, we want the lowest temperature. They're all in Kelvin for us, so we don't have to do any conversions. And that makes the answer choice one. For 17, which process represents a chemical change? Well, if you're going to have a chemical change, you're going to have bonds breaking and new bonds forming. It is not just going to be a phase change, for example. Iodine subliming, phase change. Water evaporating, phase change. Ice cube melting, phase change. Candle burning, burning, of course, is a chemical reaction, and therefore, there's your answer, choice four. All right, let's take a look at question 18. Which equation represents a physical equilibrium? If you have a system in equilibrium, whether it's physical or chemical, you're going to see a reaction with a double arrow. It means that the process is going both in the forward and reverse directions at the same time. And therefore, while choice one, I can take sodium chloride and throw it in water, get the ions, and eventually if it's saturated, it will be a physical equilibrium. It hasn't reached that yet, so it can't be choice one. Choice two, we see the double arrow. The problem is we have bonds breaking and new bonds forming. Can't be choice two. For choice three, again, only one direction. It has to be choice four. For 19, systems in nature tend to undergo changes towards lower energy, higher entropy. These are what I call the two-for-one type answers. Lower energy first, so let's get rid of choices one and two, and then higher entropy, which is choice three. Now, this is a fact that you need to know. I am putting together a whole playlist of different shorts for Regions Chemistry Review. It'll eventually make it there. Check those out really quick facts and things you need to remember on this channel for you. Question 20, which formula represents a hydrocarbon? Hydrocarbon, you could pretty much tell already in the word what two elements are there. Yeah, I'll wait for it. You're right, hydrogen and carbon only. It's got to be choice one. Now going through the rest, there's an oxygen. Can't be the answer. Here's chlorine. Can't be the answer. Here's oxygen. Can't be the answer. We are at question 21. There are 10 to go. These are flying by. Hope you're jotting down some notes. Hope you're getting them right. And if you're not, then you just need to go back and do some studying and come on back. For 21, which statement describes the bonding in an alkyne molecule? That's with the YNE ending. There is a reference table. Let's check it out. Here at reference table Q, you can see that the alkyne series is here. And what do we have? We have a carbon-carbon triple bond. So that's going to come in handy to answer the question. All right, and here we are back. 21, the carbon-carbon triple bond. But 22, we're going to end up going back to the reference tables because now it says which compound has a functional group that contains two oxygen atoms. Now, when you're dealing with functional groups with your organic molecules, you have carbons, you have hydrogens, and then you have some other nonmetal atoms. And the prefixes give us information, typically the number of carbon atoms. In the case of choice two, it gives you that there's chlorine. And then the endings have a lot of information too. We need then 
the functional group reference table, we're looking for two oxygen atoms. Let's do that. All right, we are here at reference table R, and we're just going to go down the table and find where we have two oxygen atoms. It's that simple. The only two functional groups that have two oxygen atoms as part of the molecule are organic acids and our esters. Now, how are we going to know and recognize the choice? Well, if it's an organic acid, just like any other acid, the word acid is in the name, but it's oic acid, and if it's an ester, it's going to have O8 as the ending. That's what we're looking for. Back at 22 here, amine, nope. Propane, nope. Propanoate, aha, there we go. There's our answer because of the O8. So we were looking for the O8 or for the, um, the word acid, not there, and it is definitely not an ether. So 22 was 3. For 23, which term identifies a type of organic reaction? Deposition is a phase change. Distillation is a separation technique. It is polymerization. Vaporization, again, is a phase change. There are words in vocabulary you need to know, and here it shows up again. For question 24, we're talking electrochemical cell. Oxidation occurs at, well, there are always two electrodes. We say an ox and red cat. Why do we do that? So we remember that at the anode is where oxidation takes place and reduction takes place at the cathode. In this case, then oxidation is occurring at the anode, which is choice one. All right. 25, which energy conversion occurs in operating an electrolytic cell? Now, there's two types of cells. There's a voltaic, where you're going to take chemical energy and make electrical, or electrolytic, where you take electrical energy and you make chemical. And here it is in choice two. For 26, one acid-base theory states that a base is a, you know a base has OH minus and an acid H plus. But this other theory is all about H plus donors and acceptors. So first of all, it's H plus. So you cross out one and two. Can't be that. If I have a base, a base is going to accept H plus because it's coming from the acid, which is choice four. For 27, the acidity or alkalinity of a solution can be measured by its good old pH. It has nothing to do with electronegativity, boiling point, or freezing point. For 28, when the nucleus of an atom of neon 19 decays, which particle is emitted? And you might say to yourself, well, how in the heck am I supposed to know that? You're not. You just have to go to the reference tables and look. Let's do that. All right, we are checking out table N. We're looking for neon, and here it is. We've got our neon 19, and the particle emission is beta plus. Great, we're back at 28, and now you might be saying to yourself, well, self, that's great, but I don't see any B plus here. So what gives? Well, there is another nuclear table we want to check out for both 28 and 29. So why we want to get the other symbol for a beta plus positron particle, we also want to figure out which particle has the greatest mass. For our beta plus, here are the other notations that are used. And sure enough, I'm pretty sure we'll check it when we go back, but this is the answer for that first of the two nuclear questions. Then the other question, asked about which particle being emitted would have the greatest mass. The greatest mass would be your alpha particles. Remember, your mass numbers are in the top left-hand corner, and here you see a helium nucleus, two protons, and two neutrons. Alrighty, so for 28, our answer is choice four, and for 29, our answer, once again, greatest mass, choice four. One more here at part A, which statement describes the net change that occurs during nuclear fission, and that is mass is converted into energy. That ends part A. Check out the other videos for the other parts. Don't forget about the, um, the video shorts for Regents Chemistry Review. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave them down here below the description, and as always, good luck.